All right, good morning. Um, so I, I think before we start, we should thank uh, the Culture and Rebecca and all the other presenters for their wonderful papers this weekend. And, um, and yeah, so um, what we're going to be presenting today are excerpts from kind of an ongoing experimental writing uh, machine. Um, and I'm, so I, I'm going to read a, a little bit, and then Taylor's going to read sort of sections as well. Um, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. So our, our, our paper is entitled Music Economy and Morphogenesis. Um, and, you know, I, I, I probably just to add live very quickly and give a, a, a big picture sense would be um, kind of the, the cycle of symmetry transformations within music uh, and kind of analogizing that with the living form. Um, and we'll sort of see how that gets elaborated and is, is connected out, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll get started trying to read from the music economy section here. Um, so yeah, we're going to read, you know, maybe about a fourth or a fifth of what we've actually got here. Um, and most of this should be published online pretty, pretty soon too, we think. So, um, okay, so music economy, uh, I'm going to open this with a tiny epigram from Zorbich Vili. Uh, Who's, who writes a book on Deleuze called uh, Philosophy of the Event, translated by Kieran Ahrens. Uh, in the section Time and Implication, he says, time is the intensity of bodies. This is like intended to kind of summarize Deleuze's on ontology of time. Um, okay, so a nexus forms between life and thought in which music resounds. Um, music demonically combines life and thinking into a work or a destiny. Um, uh, Agamben writes in the adventure, for the poet, what was at stake in the demon was the attempt to turn the nexus of his life and his work into a destiny. Um, and so we, we want to suggest that in the crystallization of music, time is recovered or regained or regenerated. Um, so time is, is disjoint or serialized. Um, and these series may be fixed in a, a complex moment, maybe uh, something like what Mr. Ford was suggesting. Um, these various instants that are disjoined and the series of time that are themselves disjoined are transfigured in a crystallization. Um, and so the, the temporalities involved in art are quote unquote of the last instance. They're one time each time. Uh, and Artaud suggests that the poem is burned on reading. Um, so art is consumed by immanentizing it, uh, and afterwards it can only be resurrected from ashes. It's flush with an abstract machine. It forms an extension of abstract machines in the direction of cultures, um, forming cultural machines or abstract cultures. Uh, so we have the consumption of culture and the production of universes, and the world is kind of caught up in this vortex between them, uh, the, in between the series of consumption or habitus and a series of universal production. Um, so in this vortex, uh, there's a kind of parallax occultation um, that might be necessary to catch sight of the world, uh, of these torsional lines, and of the curvature that, that signs take on in this vortex or this void. Um, the conventional sign is ambiguous because it is arbitrary. Um, and the other series of signs that is beyond the conventional series or the worldly series of signs, they turn this ambiguity into profundity. And we, we see the manufacturing of specific yet increasingly abstract or dematerialized or spiritual signs that will finally form the series of the signs of art. And this last series of signs, um, which make up the time of the refrain, are the elements of crystallization. They're signs of times that are long past, but also still to come. Signs of impossible times, pasts that were never past, um, an alternating present. Um, so all, art turns the world into a machine and in this machine, the meaningless signs of the world that have been cast into the void are reclaimed. Their proper series of time is restored or regenerated. Uh, so the future beams into the present at these critical moments and places, these crystallizations that become possible through music um, in a kind of harmonic conjunction of signs or a melodic disjunction of time. Um, so there's this critical transdifferentiation of time on the basis of a musical model of philosophy. Um, and this raises question of what the future potentially still has in store and the potential future evolution of the concept of the concept, um, raising a, a kind of curious question of what, what remains in philosophy 
Um, the question which seems to be most resonant even in the, the times where we have the most abundant kind of metaphysical research and development. Um, and I, yeah, the resonance of this, this problem of what, what remains in philosophy, where the, the concept of the concept will go, we, we think this, this question can only deepen. Um, and that there's a kind of a glare of the blank horizon of time to come. Uh, and they're kind of prefiguring a joy, a joy wisdom to come, is how I would like to say some of this. Um, yeah, we'll skip over some. So there's a, there's a music of our lives, a music that plays us even as we play it. Um, so the time of the refrain is also at the time of a life. Um, a lifetime passes in, in these musical crystallizations. Uh, so music is a kind of sonorous map of a becoming. Time crystallizes into disjunctions, into a moment and a context, a refrain that's also a signal, a body that's also a transceiver. Um, and so all these series diverge, and in the last instance they're only unified by a, an accident, a contingency, or a, indeed a deliberate crashing of all the stratifications of the series of time. Um, so music can do this uh, through its ph phenomenological singularity, through its revelation. Um, there's a worldlessness in the purest phrases of music, um, and they're, you know, they're carried forth into wordless encounters, into pure innocent moments, whose lines converge into tensors, um, figures that are innocent, like a geometrical relation or a chemical reaction. This innocence of a musical composition. Um, music doesn't even demand, like some forms of art, a total availability, but only resonance. Um, it only needs the singularities and dynamisms that we already have or that we can elaborate through harmonization, our, our dancing, our excitation, our voice. So music is spirit. It's, a, it's the spiritual matrix of a becoming. And um, we, we would suggest speculatively that in a certain way people are born from the spirit of music. Um, or that at any rate, at a certain moment, a symmetry changes. It forms or breaks or cycles through. Um, and all the singularities line up in a new way. Um, and forming the distinctive points of a life, um, so a city, an idea, a moment. Um, so music economy is not trying to name a science of music, but it's something like a dialogue with a space of music that has to be constructed again and again. There's a space and a spatialization at the heart of music which render it prophetic and capable of the most immense and serene immaculations. The miracle machine of music, what a phenomenological singularity the musical form constitutes how it has programmed the singular points of our bodies and cities and ideas in order to make them dance, according to a singular refrain. Uh, the musicality of society is a binding which is both more supple and more insidious than that of shared oaths, explicit teachings, written laws. Musicality has more to do with the economy of music, which governs implicitly the shape of time, the spacing of key events, and the timing of critical moments. Music governs the unwritten, the illegible, what exceeds in conditions collectivity, that is sociality and emotions. Music governs, or sorry, music is the vector of power and its subversion at once. Uh, as Atali says, it prefigures untheorized modes of organization. So musicality pulls a species up and out. It attunes it to a universe. Uh, it's a higher politics of pure spacing, pure timing, leap, leap diagrams. So, Music economy, or, or sorry, musicology, political economy, theoretical biology. Um, our question is like, what ties this knot together? How this fuse is constructed? Um, we would suggest the answers in temporization, in the lines or the series of time which stitch together a city, an idea, a life. In this stitching, a, a crystal of time is produced. Time in its pure state, which is frozen or compactified. Um, but then this crystal thaws and a pure time is released. Time is regenerated, recovered, time regained, time reconquered. Um, so in crystallization there's a repetition in space um, and in vitalization there's a crisis of time. A repetition at the, the limit of a kind of maximal approximation. We're sort of back to the symmetry, like a cycle of symmetry changes that bring us back around. So a non-ergotic quasi-repetition. So this is a, a system that's far from equilibrium whose phase is kind of its own phase. And we, we're talking about a, a being of this phase. Um, so mu music economy recognizes fundamentally that time is non-substantial, so the past does not exist. There's a, 
and this, this accounts for the singular poignance of the disjunction of time, um, the recovery and, and memory of the past that, that was, in a sense, never present. Um, so time operates according to a, a crystallization, to a vitalization, and finally a culturalization. And so we have a repetition spatio spatiotemporal dynamics according to a distribution of singular points that are conjugated according to the crises of these points. Um, so the, the critical point is extended into a line or a living form. Um, and according to the, the extension of this crisis, the transformations of the critical point of, satur of saturation into a critical threshold of vitalization, so from, from the crystal to culture. Um, and so we have a, a culture, a living form, and a crystal. And these are each stratified time, forms or molds of time, beings which are their own phase in a far from equilibrium state. And in this far from equilibrium state, a new compactified or curled up dimension of time is, is formed. Or else this operation forms an apparatus of temporal capture, a machinery for refrigerating temporality. So music forms this nexus like an abstract matrix of pure time, which knows how to make tempor temporizations crystallize, thaw, saturate, or distill. From the crisis of instantaneity emerges a threshold of pure time, which reproduces all of time in disjoining it. So the instant is no longer a point, but a complex moment. A new line of time has intervened, propagating an internal rhythm, which paces the external one. So local and global time. We have music forking or bifurcating the line of time. Um, and so we can see this in vitalization or, or culturalization in the production of one-dimensional codes that are localizing or individuating, that are accumulating random events and mutations, such as writing or the genome, um, but also transducing programs for the generative abstract machinery of three-dimensional forms. Um, so distributing a kind of reversible temporality of the living form or of worlds. Um, so again, a, like a, a local time that's one directional and a global time that's reversible, right? Um, and so we're, we're getting some of these ideas from Longo and Montevi, who write a book on, or called Perspectives on Organisms. Um, and in the strange cunning pages of this, of this text, we find a, a curious reinvigoration and reincarnation of Simondon. And um, their efforts seem to us to be thoroughly Simondonian, but without a single reference to him. Right. Um, but the, the metaphysics in the work are confined quite thoroughly to the, the theoretical object, to the living, to the living form. Um, in the, they, but they, they think through the objectivization of the theory of the living form through the knowing subjects who understand it, so like through scientists and experimenters, and they want to think through this dynamic relay between theory and experiment. Um, and they, they do explicitly reference some metaphysics, but it's generally kind of eidetic. It's about the transcendental field of subjectivity, mm -hmm. as it's elaborated in Husserl. Um, and they want to relate phenomenology to the living form in the form of, or through the, the means of characteristic lengths and intervals, and um, the generation of a, of a biotemporality, right? A complex moment in which more and more of the past and the future are swept up into, into the moment, um, protended or retained. Um, so the, the living form and the knowing subject, right? Um, uh, Longo and Montevi are very curious about the individuation of our knowledges. So not so much the origin of the living form from the inert, but the transition between theories of inert to theories of the living form. So it's a theoretical transition that operates according to a plan and at the limit achieves this new perspective. Um, and, and so, there's this notion of, the, again, the critical extension of the point um, and into a, an extended criticality or a, a, a kind of crisis of time. Um, and we would suggest this is also the crisis at work in, in cities and in thinking. Um, and so we, we think this extended criticality can, can be of importance in understanding the process of time it, itself becoming crystallized. Um, hopefully as part of an analysis of the Deleuzian notion of the crystal of time. And we think Simondon is fundamental to all this, um, at least in terms of the individuation of technical and vital knowledges, um, individuating our knowledge of living, you know, of the knowing subject and of the living form. Um, and we, we want to approach the living form as a transcendental field of singularities, of symmetry transformations, 
of plastic transdifferentiation and of transduction of form and matter and content. So the, the perspective on organisms that Longo and Montevi engender through this daring conception of extended criticality, it, quote, approaches the mathematical nature of biological objects as a limit or asymptotic case of physical states. The latter, these asymptotic cases of physical states, may yield the dense structure of critical points in a non-trivial interval of viability, situation not considered by current physical theories who are concerned mainly with equilibrium or close to equilibrium states. So in a sense, it is the very principles grounding physical theories that we are modifying through an actual limit. In short, biological objects are analyzed here in terms of partial but continuous changes of symmetry within an interval of viability as an extended locus of critical transitions. So biological time, in, sorry, in quote. So biological time is paced by symmetry changes. We are cycling between singularities or combinations of singularities, configurations, and we are subject to these anomalous orbits. Um, in, in a kind of phase space. So life is a kind of limit of physical inertia, a supersaturation of critical, of critical points that introduces a new internal temporization, a new dimension of time, a crystallization by other means, uh, capture singularities by the living form, a transcendental evolution of time or a revolution in music. Music is a revolution against time, uh, the invention of a new order of time, or a vitalization and regeneration of time. So the time of the refrain is time reconquered, or at least it holds out this possibility of warding off black hole effects, of preserving singularities unscathed, of thawing the crystal, and permitting new cycles of symmetry transformations. Um, so life goes on, or it is combined with thinking into a new work, possibly a new earth and a people to come. Um, and I think at this point we would just indicate a kind of strange destiny of both the living form and the refrain. Um, to potentially reverse the flow of time, or at least to form new kinds of systems within time. Yeah, so after working through uh, the music economy section, there's a, there's a kind of excursus and a segue that develops crystallization towards um, a sort of shallow dive into the occult and its possibilities, and so this is the section uh, I'm going to read from today. Uh, as Felix Guattari said, there's no language in itself. It shouldn't be presupposed as universal. And we also believe that there is no occult in itself, right? Uh, o cultures, with an O, always imply counter, adjacent, or subjacent A culturations with respect to the majoritarian cultures as their conditions of possibility. <clears throat> Which we asked, does culture depend recursively on the occult? So it is important to distinguish in cultures and O cultures between the cruelty of, as Deleuze and Guattari talk about in anti oedipus the primitive territorial machine, the terror of the despotic machine, and then the postmodern cynicism of the capitalist machine. Because the movements and maneuvers sweeping along the occult are not the same from machine to machine. So does this mean that the occult always reacts to the dominant codes? We were kind of investigating this. Um, like the question of writing, the question of the first occulture indicates a disparity between zones of power and a nascent imperialism. This is the question of the first initiate and the first occulture. Uh, Solomon straying from Yahweh's exclusivity, the lore of Malach. Can we say it is simply a lore of annihilation or the cruel music of destruction, of sacrifice? Um, does the enjoyment of music lie in sacrifice? The love of life burning itself out, love and burning imminence. And here we sort of have a little aside about Nagarastani, who in Cyclonopedia talks about the abstract lover. And he says um, that it's usually associated with love as incomplete burning, this chromatic distortion of all colors to pink, an involuntary submission to the desert. That's the end of the quote. Um, but take the case of Newton. Uh, it's the occult foundations of the physical sciences, strange geometries, the unworldliness of the alchemist. Does the occult represent the old way of knowing? Newton's prism or the diffraction of history? The occult knows, quote unquote, the old way because it still resists communication. It forms a site of heretical resistance, especially from the perspective of information ecology. Does the occult then correlate with slower movements of information? A greater resonance in the hyperchamber of the matrix of listening, hyperconsciousness. Is Zarathustra, quote unquote, occulting when he retreats to the heights and undergoes rarefaction? And there's a beautiful quote about how the, the highest mountains are in the sea, right? The highest comes from the deepest. 
The occult or the revolt against time? And this is a question, the revolt of the abyss of time against the heights. Does the occult perhaps mark an indignity of communicating, asserting the impossibility of communicating, or rather establishing levels of communication, communicating from different perspectives as needed? And as uh, Longo and Simondo might talk about uh, a development of amplification, specifically in the crystal resulting in internal resonance, Perhaps the occult is more clearly identified by the mode of organization it operates, the disjoint zones of power, heresy and dissimulation, chameleon infiltration of all the strata. Uh, the occult time war involves everyone, even and especially if they're largely unaware. We're all susceptible to this lore from the outside, which emanates from within literature. The greatest work is always universal, even if access isn't or isn't easy. Uh, the occult implies minoritarian collective assemblages of enunciation. This assemblage of enunciation infuses a marvel with the uncanny. An occult signifier lures away from the majoritarian image of thought. These are the productive thefts and buggerings that Deleuze will talk about. Combinations of elements of the image, permuting letters, numbers, symbols, but also conjugating critical points and lines with the singular fluctuations of the body. The combination of times into a moment, using fragments of time which may be of the inhuman ancient past or the remotest future. The signs of the occult are combinatory, strange plane of consistency upon which a culture weaves its uncanny plots, deploying lures or constructing marvelous devices. An occult assemblage of enunciation orates the unconscious of an abstract machine as its combinatory underside, taking enjoyment in the mechanical permutation of elements and generative principles. We sort of go off on an aside about Roman Jakobson and the six dimensions of language, uh, message sender, receiver, channel code. Um, and then we get to go through some fun stuff about the cyclone, which we'll leave out for today. Uh, a cultures counteractualize the past, mobilizing the schemas and strategies of the past within the present. The occult regime of signs participating obscurely in the series of time. I emit signs which are counter-signifying or a-signifying or both at the optimal time and place where these signs can extend the speculative abstraction of culture into the world. The inherent barbarism of the occult from the dominant perspective. Um, and this is, uh, we can also think of Laura Well in Philofiction, that it's fiction to and from philosophy's resistance and perspective. An indifference of interiority, dif uh, dissonance between schema and strategy, a metapolitical warp, but also a challenge, a potential violence to exteriority, threat to structure of determination. The cult makes the programs execute, executed by the abstract machines, which are responsible for distributing degrees of reality or existence to the variously stratified bands and packs of the unconscious, granting and selecting the pure multiplicities which will be, quote unquote, of the world, disjoined into crystallization in the conventional series of the worldly and the void. This is the threat of the minoritarian that refuses to replace the major mode, minoritarian culture, qua minoritarian. How to move beyond simple opposition, resemblance, contradiction, a question of the authenticity of difference and repetition. Against the background of universal inauthenticity, only a functional or machinic selection is possible. The past is sifted, the runes exhumed, the occult seeker is after artifacts that may still function. How does the occult want the truth? It is like the way the Inquisitor wants the truth, according to his own lights. Or it is more like that of the lover who sees in the eyes of his beloved an inaccessible universe and is condemned to jealous, or, sorry, or is it, this is a question, this is an open question, or is, it, or is he condemned to jealous deciphering of the beloved's lies? Um, we think of the case of Swan, right? Um, Deleuze's occultation within the history of philosophy. Laurel, for example, wants to accuse Deleuze that he acts like he's recovered a long lost secret, some precious metaphysical treasure, and this is the height of naivete for Larwell. Um, but Deleuze indeed does rediscover uh, only as a necessary provisional step in finding a way to form a new creation of his own. And this is what he's trying to get at with one of his last concepts, the crystal of time he develops in uh, Cinema 2. Um, and this is sort of, uh, as Zora Beachvili will say, this is like uh, um, this notion of the crystal of time conducts. Uh, a lightning bolt with a, it's, it's, an, it's a lightning bolt insurrection within thinking. 
In the disjunction of times and a connection of temporalities without conjunction, we are permitted to become attuned to the distance, disagreement, or dissonance of these distinguished times, forming a complex moment, uh, momentaneousness rather than an instant, a singular multiplicity rather than a unity plurality dyad. In the moment, the biological time of morphogenesis, the sonorous time of transduction, the luminous time of transdifferentiation. What is the dream prefigure? Musical analysis of dreams. A dream is an information ecology. Signals pass into each other forming bridges or overtones, or they form gaps, cancellation. Cuts appear, scenes are transfigured, a catastrophe occurs, obscure. The reality of the dream can sometimes seem <coughs> overwhelming, the veritable sense of being there. The sign of the dream is especially significant because of this phenomenal virtualism. The symbolism of dreams operates apparently without fiction. Although the memories we form of the dream seem to possess a fugacity and ephemerality not unlike the evanescence of sound. Sono analysis. J. Say asks what your dreams sound like. We sono analysts might ask the shape of your sonic territories, the noise your design machines make, the dimensionality of your sound world. How to measure your musical writing, musicality in writing, perhaps especially in the scene of dream writing, the refrains of the factory floor of the unconscious. And um, I'll just sort of end with a quick little uh, mention of Adorno before letting Joe finish out the, the talk. Um, so Adorno writes um, this short little essay called Theses on Occultism. And there's a, there's a sort of bitterness to it that I found to be a, a kind of pessimism about uh, um, his concern for this vulgar reversal of Hegel. And I question if his um, sort of attack against occultism is, isn't just from the perspective of knowledge, where it actually, um, if it were privileging the other side of the eminence of lived experience, you know, what Larwell calls ordinary mysticism, then he might be a little bit more charitable. And I, uh, I kind of suggest that what maybe Adorno needs is a little bit of Hume. Hume's openness to the eventual uh, verification of miracles. What we call miracles today can be science tomorrow. Um, and Joe responds very thoughtfully, yet Adorno's pessimism was justified and highly relevant for the era, for the time, for his life. Perhaps we even might do well to adopt some degree of the pessimism of that era today, which after all enabled a solidary resistance to growing fascism, which was indexed by rampant irrationalism, not incidentally tied up at every point with non-rational occultating lines. Irresponsible usages of mystical disjunctions. The importance of a dose of experimental verification is well known to the great master of aesthetics, dour as he may have been or been made to become by the tragedies he endured. He's thinking of the Shoah, his exile, the terrible certainties um, such a life must have offered. The problem of optimism and pessimism, perhaps besides the point of the occult, whose joyous devaluation of the major image and subversion ridicule of images of reason may take on a positive or negative valence. It is the negative pole of unreason which connects up with fascist irrationalism. And this is where the, the prospect of hyper-reason uh, can be engaged. But you know, we're running short, so let me hand back over to you. So by way of conclusion, let me read a section that we've entitled Memories of a Sono Analyst. Uh, Just a paragraph. It's a, yeah, it's a quick paragraph. So, uh, taking time for sound, making space for it, without sinking into the noise, but traversing in archipelagic movement the fantasy of listening. The matrix of fictions, which is the audible, which connects us along an imaginary or abstract waveband to the plane of sound, to a sound world, to the pre-personal singularities of sonority and its pure state. Sound is upstream of culture. The way in which we hear a cultural refrain, the way in a worldly sign passing through the void strikes us becomes a fascinating sign to decode lovingly. The attachment, always the same song, it had to be you. And the way the sad passions are tied up in this expressive line of pure sound or subjectivation, the musicality of territorialization. The subjection of music is also the object of territoriality. How does music become the property of the territory, a pure sonic trait or aesthetic aspect, a dimensional factor or coefficient of deterritorialization? A musical line is like a vector field or tensor which leads us forward, pulls up and out along a spironomic line of development towards the transindividual, towards rarefaction, in the direction of infinite variation. Pure variability of the music line. Pure phrasing of a musical time, a time which intervenes into its own elaborating and inducing serialization, crystallization, fragmentation. 
Time is out of joint, it coalesces into crystalline disjunctions, it rewrites itself through memory, it is transfigured and becoming intense, which activates the entire milieu. The whole universe takes on a new tint. The temperature is increasing chromatic distortion to pink. Music is love or universal consciousness of becoming everyone and everything, which follows the path of infinite variability adrift on a line of continuous transition, subject to a pluripotent and cyclonic mm -hmm. symmetry, a dynamic extension of crisis, plastic amplification of catastrophe, and incomplete burning. Perhaps incomplete owing to the counterformation of anastrophic lines of regeneration, recovery, and temporal reconciliation. Thank you.